and welcome to episode four of Set the Table. I am John, and with me is Jack. Good day. And uh, we are here this week to talk about modules. Um, last week we talked about players and player types, in particular the more problematic ones that you may have to deal with sort of earlier on if you are just beginning. And if you are just beginning, um, it may be good to learn about modules. So I won't skip it this week. Uh, what did you play in the past two weeks? So I played in my Monday night 5th edition group. And we did... Um... We're we're running through a homebrew campaign. So my uh, my gnome uh, bard, she's kind of the leader of the party. Um, she tried uh, to get a job as a cabaret singer in one of the uh, seedier uh, underground speakeasies. So nice. Dorea is terrifying. My, yes, my Smurf Neblin bard is terrifying. She frightens uh, the other party members, and sometimes she even frightens the players. Nice. Um, I, my, my D&D group played. Um, we are also playing 5th edition, and <clears throat> they learned the location of a couple of objects that they were looking for. And uh, last time we played, they had scouted out the demonic village where they had to, or where they were told that those items were located. And they planned for a little while how to, how to go about it. And what they ended up doing was sending in the rogue monk multiclass um, with the druid who had wild shaped into a mouse um, and just sort of went along with the uh, the rogue in case they needed a, a quick way out because she has a magic item that teleports her to wonderful places and between m multiple availabilities of the casting of invisibility and pass without trace um, I I forget what she had as a total plus modifier, um, but she rolled a 35 at one point for a stealth check, and uh, they were wildly successful. Uh, all up until the the rest of their party, who was waiting, watching over the village uh, from a cliff was not watching behind them and were attacked by a Varrock. And they drew the ire of a few of the flying demons um, and dispatched some of those. The monk rogue and the druid made it out and they are on their way uh, down the mountain after pummeling a trio of rocks. Uh, they killed one and the other two got away because they didn't want to die. And for other reasons that the party may or may not know yet. Mm -hmm. So that's where we're at. <clears throat> um, Thanks. We, we both mentioned that well, we're both playing in, in homebrewed campaigns and homebrewed storylines. Uh, so the opposite of homebrew is official or unofficial written content um i guess it would be the opposite of homebrew would be official written content um so not a good segue but a module is a story or adventure or setting um, some supplemental information uh to help you run or to entirely let you run stories and adventures or tabletop games right it's it's pre-written content there you go in the in the game setting that you're playing so um we've been heavily 5e D, &D 
there are modules for Traveler. There are modules modules for Starfinder. Um, the concept of a module uh, kind of got invented in the late 1970s, early 1980s by TSR, right? They put out their Dungeons & Dragons adventures, and if you bought the the basic or the expert edition D and D it came with, um, when I got around to playing, it came with B2 keep on the borderlands. I wish I had one. I don't have one in my office. Um, but it's, Oh, the cover, you slip the cover off and there's a map and inside was a, a small packet of information and, Oh, there you go. Curse of Strahd. <laughs> there you That's kind of the, so back in the olden days, they were a lot smaller and a lot more cheaply made. Uh, and today we have the Curse of Strahd. That's a that's also a module. I kind of some people will oh that's an expansion or that's a splat book. And I'll talk about expansions and we'll talk about expansions and splat books splat books coming on. But when I think module, I think it's a pre written story or adventure. Could be from the company, so it could be from Wizards of the Coast Hasbro. For D and D, it could be from Far Future Enterprises for Traveler. It could be part of from Pinnacle Entertainment if you're playing Savage Worlds. But uh, it doesn't have to be right. There are other places to find modules. Uh, but that's kind of what we'll talk about tonight. Is I'm a new DM. I want to play this game. I really like the setting. I've kind of got a good feel for the rules. What do I do next? Well. If you're a homebrew aficionado, you start drawing maps and writing stories and making up kingdoms and lands and situations. If you don't have that kind of time or energy, go to your friendly local game store and then look for the shelf of modules and just start reading. You'll sure. you'll find <clears throat> something to play, right? That's that the the nice thing about being a role play game. Uh, fan in in the year 2020 is there is way more content available than you have time to play than than any human being could ever play in a yep. lifetime yep so why <clears throat> you said if you're a new dm but if you're not or even if you are why why would you bother using a module in the first place um, so yeah you go ahead yeah, so uh, you don't use them, so I want to hear what you're gonna say. <laughs> I, I well, we can talk about that too. I don't tend to use modules. Uh, I never have yet. I'm not opposed to it. I'm not against using a module, um, but you would use one if you just wanted to play, right? If you have no setup planning writing encounter design if you don't want to do any of that <clears throat> or don't have the time to do that you might use a module if you are brand new and you maybe have played maybe haven't played but you have found yourself in the dm gm role and you need a guide somewhere to start um, that's why you might use a module or if you are more of the actor performer type than the writer designer type, then modules may be for you as well. Um, like you said, I don't use modules. Uh, I have been slowly developing a universe of my own for over seven years now, and that is world locations people points of interests quests legends the songs that the bards sing in the taverns a pantheon uh their own unique calendar um i mean i i've just put a lot of time and love into that environment and i want my games to occur in that environment um i don't dislike the Forgotten Realms and Faerun, or Eberron, or Greyhawk, or Barovia, or where have you. But I like having something that is unique and my own, I guess. Um, the creative 
flex <clears throat> sorry creative flexibility is a big piece for me I like being able to look at a, a calendar or a timeline of events and say okay this was uh, 150 years ago so when when would this have started changing in the world and what does that change for now for the players and who remembers that who's still alive to remember that because if i have a 900 year old elf talking to a 30 year old human it's going to be a you know a pretty big history gap there so i mm. like having the creative flexibility to fill in information like that without worrying about stepping on canon or saying something that one of my particularly well-read players will say wait no that's not what happened in this year this Bruner is what battle happened. hammer didn't discover galtal grim until dale reckoning blah yep, yep yeah right um and and that's the advantage of using a module is that um one of the reasons i like modules is that they have kind of fact the publisher has kind of fact checked that canon mm -hmm. right so if you buy a module from hasbro wizards of the coast they will have right chednaza if you're playing in a certain time period in the underdark right chednazad has fallen and has broken up right you read read the lisa smedman uh books and and that city's been destroyed in the canon it'll be destroyed in the module. Right. Uh, the other thing I like about modules is that uh, depending on the publisher, not all publishers do this, but depending on the publisher, the module will have been play tested and balanced. So if yeah, I'm playing sure. a module for levels four to seven, when I get into an encounter with a party, you know, I've got a party of four level four bards or crypt players right now four level four bards bards god that'd be a terrible party that'd be a great party it might be a messy adventure yeah. um but it has been it has been balanced for that group and as the module as the story progresses um the rewards inside the story will be building towards that climax yeah, Curse of Strahd uh, does that really well. Yes, and Curse of Strahd is one of those examples where you acquire things and information and magical items and abilities as you're playing and you're growing as a character, and then when you confront Strahd, you, you don't just like, oh, cool, you now I'm dead. You hopefully found them. Right. No spoilers. Um, and, and we can talk about that, too. That's one, one of the other downsides with modules that some people don't like is there are some modules that are sandboxy like hey you're in barovia and you're in this city and and when i played curse of strahd we frustrated our dm ryan um terribly because we we had almost three weeks of what we uh affectionately called putzing we were in town and we were shopping and we were checking out the the nightlife in barovia and trying to make friends with different people and and, and he's like, okay, look, you're supposed to be someplace else by now. Um, move on. Um, so that's that open world sandboxy kind of thing. Some modules uh, put you on rails. You're going to go to this room in the dungeon and encounter this thing. Then you're going to move to the next room in the dungeon and encounter this thing. That's probably um, another reason why I don't like them. Because I yep. am not a fan of rails. I like really open-ended stuff where if my party right now said, okay, we're going to give these items to the paladins that we came with, then we're going to say goodbye and go do something completely different, I would be unfortunate for a little bit. Because the you, next story you bits... Struggled. You struggled with Portal Under the Stars when we played DCC, because that one is on rails, right? Uh, yeah, that's the one... The, the lake under... Nope, that's uh, Sailors of the Starless uh, Sea, oh, which okay. is one of my absolute favorite modules. No, Sailors has a little bit more open, but Portal Under the Stars That is... was the Terracotta Warriors, right? Yes. Okay. Yep. And, <laughs> yes. and, and it, is, it is linear. There is only one place where you can decide... There's one room with three doors, and then everything else is 
hallway door room hallway door room hallway door room yeah i don't like uh, that and and yeah i mean some people and when we when we talk about how to pick a module right do you want something that's on rails hmm. because and and rails aren't bad right if you have a group of um adventurers you have a group of players who are not fantastic with the sandbox there are some players who just don't like that like yep there are <laughs> you, you know i mean most of my group <laughs> if if you look at fiction and and if you're if you have a player who is a big fan of fantasy fiction right the gandalf shows up he scratches bilbo's door the dwarves show up they have a party and then there's an adventure and boom 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 this happens then this happens then this happens then this happens yeah. If you have players that want that experience, right, um, then you're going to want that module that's more on rails. Sure. And if you don't, right, if you have players who are, um, we'll put this in video game terms, right? If if you have players who really enjoyed Dragon Age, right, Dragon Age is kind of on rails. You go here, you do this. Uh, then I'm thinking of one of the older Dragon Age games, right? You become a Grey Warden, and you you can go to one of these three places. But guess what? You're going to all three places right. to finish the game, right? Um, but if you have players who are more Grand Theft Auto Five, Red Dead Redemption, like, Skyrim. okay, hey, man, here's a gun and a horse. What do you want to do? Yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that's, that's your more open-ended modules. And you can find modules that are hardcore rails, uh, and you can find modules that are wide open hex crawls. Or well, and so when we when we defined module, one of the things we listed was settings. So your module, or I guess what I would call a supplement, might just be a book full of locations and people and items and things, and how you string those together is is more up to you. So so this is I'm gonna. This is where I'm going to go down to expansions and source books and splat books and modules. Sure. Okay. All right. Well, so hold on. Let's before we do that, because you mentioned um, with everybody having access to a module, uh, it might be such that your players have all read it. Um, and so that's yeah. we weighing uh, pros and cons, I guess, as we have kind of been doing it is nice for every player at the table sometimes well i think many people enjoy having some degree of shared knowledge about the world that you are in so playing something in Faerun forgotten realms oh i've read the r.i salvatore books i kind of know what water deep and icewind dale and neverwinter are like i I have an understanding, and if I say something, if I say Waterdeep, everyone at the table knows what that is. I it must have been such a better city. Well, y yes and no. Um, I'm, just I'm just messing with you. <laughs> <laughs> that is a totally different discussion. Okay. Um, I like using and this is this is the novelty of being a writer i suppose more than modules versus not um but i thoroughly enjoy that having my own world for my players to be in uh it does a couple things one i think it creates a more novel experience the players don't necessarily know what some things are so if they go there it's more fantastical than if they had read about it beforehand and it's just like, oh, okay, it's cool. My guy's there. I know what it is. So, nah. Um, I think it helps reduce metagaming because you can't do stuff like, oh, I, I know exactly what that item is or I know exactly who this person is. So, like, I have read about it in the book. Um, but it, on the on the flip side, though, I'll play devil's advocate here. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm trying, if I'm playing a Rohirrim and I'm riding to Edoras in in a One Ring game, right? I understand the social norms and the con cultural context of what my player is interacting with. Mm -hmm. So, right? I mean, if I'm if I again if I'm a rider of Rohan going to talk to Theoden, 
he's my king and I need to behave in a certain way. And, and yeah. these are the, this is the frank cult, cultural framework in which I'm, I'm connecting to. So you're, Versus if I, if I was riding to Erebor, right. Well, I'm going to go talk to the doors. Oh crap. I have a whole different cultural, right. Relationship so, with dwarves. So, so I, I'm you're, sorry pro here or your con whatever your op your counterpoint my counterpoint that's a good word is basically my third point was that it encourages players to ask questions and be more engaged with the world and the story mm -hmm. where if you've got a halfling rogue from waterdeep who knows every corner shop and cobblestone then they're not gonna they're you're gonna have people at the table who's characters haven't been there and who are role-playing better who are oh what is this and they're just be like it's it's this it's this it's that like it, it is what it is you know yeah um i like players being more engaged like that and i think it contributes to players um thinking more about their backstories and i didn't want to force that so i home ruled when we started my group that if you had a character that you wanted to be from somewhere that you were familiar with, we can say that that location lies far across the sea and, and boom, you're fine. Yeah. Um, so I, I, cause I don't like rails. <laughs> I don't want right. to force people to, Oh no, you have to be from one of these towns. And if you want to know more about that town, then um, ask and I will write you 16 pages in a Google doc and share it with you. Which has happened. Yeah. Um, not not every DM has that kind of time and energy and, and I know creative and, spark. And interest. The most interesting part of this, I think, is despite me not using modules, I would like to write and sell modules that other people would use. So, true. Yep. <laughs> hopefully, there are other people that also want their adventures to occur outside of D and D canon. Um, and I'm going to take this moment to selfishly plug the Red Hoodie blog. Uh, if you are a new DM and are looking for some inspiration, head on over to redhoodiegames5.wordpress.com where you can find bi-weekly posts including character concepts if you need some inspiration for characters or NPCs, or um, there are adventure hooks. Uh, some are more fleshed out and others are much shorter, more room for you to roam as it were. Um, and generally any other content that you might feel like using at your table. Um, so that is redhoodiegames5.wordpress.com. So expansion source books, splat books. I'm going to let you right. take this one. All right. So I'll start with splat books. And we get the term splat book from our friends at White Wolf Games who are famous for releasing these things. Um, and we've had conversations already about fluff, fluff versus crunch. Yep. Right? Fluff is story and flavor and thematic writing. My and ranger crunch. uses two hand axes, not swords. And, uh, or, you know, the the vampires who run Chicago, they love jazz music, right? The, this kind of, like, fluffy doesn't really, I mean, it, it gives more color and range to your creative uh, energies, but it's not, if you want to take this action, you roll these dice with to look for this outcome. It's not rules. That's right? crunch. That's crunch. And so the Splat book um, introduced a tremendous amount of fluff to the World of Darkness games. Vampire, werewolf, mage, changeling, right? Each... Um, in those, in those game settings, you have... Vampires have clans, which you can think of as classes kind of loosely yeah. and each clan got its own clan book which talked about the history of the clan and super important vampires within the clan and uh it had a little bit of extra like if you are a high level toreador you might have access to uh these additional powers but it wasn't very very you you didn't need those splat books to play any mechanics in the game they right. they were they were uh, lots of additional fluff so that's when i when you think when i think splat book i think the tribe books from werewolf 
the clan books from Vampire, the tradition books from Mage. And other games do this as well. Other games have these uh, splat books. Uh, Riffs from Palladium had a ton of, of splat books that would tell you about a specific area, certain NPCs, um, but not... And you could use those to create an adventure, but they weren't an adventure, right? Right. So you get clan book Toreador. There's no Toreador specific story for you to tell uh, at your vampire game. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's what I, when I say splat book, that's kind of in my mind, it's a book that is primarily fluff that helps the players get a broader understanding of their character, class, their clan, their location, that kind of stuff. Yep. Um, so. I, I would also put the the omnibus 800 page um, guide to Glorantha in that <laughs> splat book. I mean, they're not splat, but be, you hit somebody with that book, and you're going to hear a, more than a splat. Yeah. Um, those are like <laughs> the the box set is like 14 pounds. It's ridiculous, but it, I mean, it's and it's beautiful and it's amazing. I and I don't mean it's ridiculous, silly. I mean it's it's just wow. Um, so then we move to source books, and and where I draw the line between source book and splat book is that a source book gives you a new setting with some additional rules. So where a splat book has very no has no crunch or very very little crunch, a source book is going to be a mixture of fluff and crunch. So think Octung, I think Octung Cthulhu, right? Okay. Call of Cthulhu in the middle of World War II. The book has some rules for firearms, World War II era firearms, world operating World War II era aeroplanes and submarines, and then a whole bunch of, you know, this this unit in Hitler's uh, occult studies wing actually unlocked the gateway to the plateau of Ling and they're using it to do all of these weird experiments on super soldiers. And this group of OSI, the office of special investigations out of the Pentagon are countering them with these kinds of, of activities. So there's a bunch of fluff and then some crunch. Uh, and you see source books in those games like GURPS and Savage Worlds and Fate, generic style role play games. Um, also, the Genesis line from from Fantasy Flight has a core rule book that has no fluff whatsoever. And then, if you want to play in Terranoth, which is the land from RuneQuest, there's a Terranoth book, which is a source book, has rules for elves and dwarves and dragons um and it plugs into the genesis playing system uh, if you don't want to play with rune quests they have a android netrunner source book out so you can play in the world of android netrunner um but that's kind of where i where i would say a source book and, and and gurps is the the poster child steve jackson games is the poster child for the source book right so uh <clears throat> i i would classify um players handbooks and monster manuals dm's guides as source books as well see now i put those in expansions the player handbook is an expansion no so no no okay let me let me so the player's handbook the monster manual and the dm guide those three books in the DD world that's the core rule book right for me okay so if I want to play Pugmire, I go by the Pugmire Coral Rulebook, and that is how to be a player, how to be a GM, and a bunch of monsters and NPCs, right? Okay. And a lot of companies have adopted this. Here's the core rulebook. It has those three sections um, for you to use, like Alien, the Alien game right. we played. At the core rulebook, and it had all three of those sections. I think... For historical reasons, and and when Dungeons and Dragons was first invented in 1974, those were three separate pieces. Yeah, and so I think um, TSR has always marketed them as three separate books. Wizards of the Coast kept that same three separate, um, and then Hasbro now has continued that 
sure. that long. I just oh. wanted to make sure that we were covering where those fit in, um, because if you are a newer DM, you are probably making sure that you have your core rule books before you're exploring expansions, source books, flat books, modules, right. etc. Yeah. So those. So if you're if you're committed to the five E universe, those three books kind of make up the core rule book, yeah. right? Um, if you're in the Paizo uh, ecosystem, there's and you're playing Starfinder, for example, the Starfinder core rulebook has all three of those elements in the one rulebook, and the Pathfinder core rulebook again has those three elements. Now, Pathfinder, of course, has lots of expansions. In the D and D world, when I think expansion, I think Xanthar's Guide to Everything. Okay. Okay. Sure. Um, any if if you're in, and again you have to get your DM's approval, but the the way Xanthar is presented or Unearthed Arcana, if you're playing a D and D, um, everything in that book plugs into any five E setting. Right. Right. Where if you get the if you get the um, Eberron source book, it creates the Eberron setting. Does that make sense? Sure. So Xanathar, so expansions can be used with any core material and source books add to core material. So if you have base 5e, you've got a uh, a source book or a module, right? Mm -hmm. Um so I mean, so could you call Curse of Strahd a source book? So I call so so Curse of Strahd for me is a module. Right, that's what I would call it too. I was right because it it doesn't really introduce anything mechanically different from Core Five E. Right. So I would so if you're looking for a Five E source book, um, it'd be Unearthed I, Arcana now, right? I still would would look at that as an expansion. I'm thinking more of the, and I forget the publisher, so forgive oh, me. That's right. But there's a publisher that produces, it might be Cubicle 7, uh, Middle Earth source books for D&D 5th edition. So if you want to play a token canon game you are correct. With, the, with the Shire and Rivendell and Mirkwood and Dull Goldor, Head over to Cubicle 7, and there are a set of source books for 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons that will give you all of the mechanics you need to hang out with Radagast the Brown and, and talk about the bear people and Bjorn and his 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 ilk, right? Sure. That's that's When I think of 5th edition source book, that's kind of where I go. Or and Erebor or Greyhawk. And then you've got Xanathars, which you could use, theoretically in that setting for the source book, which has expanded your core availability. Right. All right. So, uh, splat books, source books, expansions, uh, all stuff that you can use to enhance your games, play entire games, um, modules. Consume your disposable income, because they're awesome. You just start buying them. It's like, oh, I'm collecting this, and you start... Um, the one ring ones, they snagged me from cube again, cubicle seven. Um, and the one ring is the Lord of the Rings uh, game system that doesn't use the five e mechanics, but right. The, so your Lord of the Rings core rule book, right. And I, I and then the 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 um, source books added. so so they have a source book for this Merkel is a good Rick. example. Um, they have a source book for Erebor, and the source book, the Erebor book is just absolutely stunning, and it has additional rules for dwarves, and then it also has all the fluff about the dwarves of the Misty Mountain. So, um, yeah, and, and then there are, it's, 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 yeah, yep, so, so the you, source book. So you got those, and you do lots of your shopping at at Gen Con and game conventions, because you're lucky enough to get to go I, to those often. I, I get, I do lots of impulse buying at conventions. Yes. Uh, if you, I, I'm were... Jack, and I'm addicted to role play games. <laughs> Hi, Jack. <laughs> 
I'm here for my 30 second chip and then I will have to give it back to you as soon as I browse Kickstarter. Yep. <laughs> yep. Uh, yeah. So uh, if you are not someone lucky enough to get to go to gaming conventions all the time, uh, where are the best places, best, easiest, most accessible places to find um, modules and their counterparts for your table? I ended that like it was a question. So, um, uh, well, I'll take it as a question. So yep. I will obviously start with your friendly local game store, right? That's the best place to go. Number one. Looking at modules, because then you can pull them off the shelf and open them. Most of them are not shrink wrapped um, and read through them. I know all the Paizo Adventure Path ones are, they're not shrink wrapped. You can open them and look at the maps and read some of the the encounters and see if that's something that your your group wants to play um drive through rpg right if you oh, see yeah. something and you're like wow um the harrowing at harrowstone four of six crap i really like what's going on in four of six but i can't find one of six or two of six or three of six right drive through rpg is is the place to go um drive the RPG other also while we're on dtr uh they also have lots of free or pay what you want options. Um, obviously, if you like what somebody is doing if enough to procure it and you can afford to um, support creators for sure. Um, but if you can't or if you're just starting, if you want to write your own uh, module type stuff, but you have no idea what a module looks like, first and foremost, go into your FLGS and check it out. Um, but drive through RPG has a lot of uh, financially accessible material. And, and they also have gateways into both organized play and content creator collectives. So I didn't I didn't put that in the notes, but um, the Explorers Guild for 7th C, uh, the, the DMs uh, Guild, well, the DMs Guild, which is more that's more of a that's more like um paizo's um role play game societies right starfinder and pathfinder society i don't uh, know i don't play pathfinder so so yeah that's that's but there are if you go to drive through rpg there's the storytellers vault so vampire werewolf the world of darkness and these are games that people have created modules that they've written settings that they've they've produced uh, and those are all available at drive through RPG as well. Also, uh, and this is why I said at the, at the, at the top of this, like there's more content than you can ever play. Uh, there's a website called adventure a week and they produce five E adventures at least one a week, if not more. Um, and then add on to that your third party, uh, company. So if you're big into fifth edition, you think that's awesome. Um, check out Goodman games. They are still producing fifth edition content. So there are a lot of third party publishers that are producing content for various games. And again, not just D and D, um, call of Cthulhu has a, a large, uh, following over at chaosium. A lot of content creators are developing content for those things. So, um, where to find a module, it, it, it's almost easier to say where not to find a module, right? Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, when in doubt, ask Google. Yes. And then you'll wind up with, again, <laughs> thousands of hits. Uh, probably millions, but now we're just quibbling. Now we're quibbling. <laughs> so you have, I, I'm a new DM my group, well, I'm a new tabletop roleplay game player. My group told me I have to DM. I know that I have to get dice and books and pencils and a printer and ink. Um, but I don't have the time to write my own whole thing. I, I don't even know where I would start because I've never played before. So I'm going to go buy a module. I, I go to drive through RPG and I start scrolling what what am I looking for? So how do I pick one. How do you pick one? So you, you have the millions that we've mentioned. 
how do we pick how do we pick the one so i look at this problem and i say what's what kind of schedule if you're a new gm dm um what schedule do you have are you gonna play once or twice are, are you trying it out and you're gonna play once or twice do you have a group of folks that really you know we've played a lot in other places and we really want to start a group that's going to meet every Wednesday at, at eight o'clock and play for two hours a week. Um, like, can you meet regularly? Do you have a bunch of time? Uh, so schedule, think about your schedule because there are one, sh when we get down to the types of different types of modules, right? There are one shots. They play in three hours, but at the end of three hours, you're done. Right. And there are epic, Curse of Strahd, right? You could spend months of real physical time playing Curse of Strahd, depending on how your players want to role play and how they explore and their interaction with with the the land of Barovia. Right. Um, you know, it took there's, us there's a lot a year and a half to get through Curse of Strahd playing three hours a week. So. Think moment. about your schedule and then think about your interests. Do you want rails? Do you want sandbox? Do you want a mystery story? Do you want a, um, so th think about what you're interested in, right? Yeah. Uh, and then what are your goals? What are your, what are your goals as a DM? And then what are your players goals? Are are they really interested in kind of the murder hobo chic, like kick the door down, kill the goblins, take their stuff, go to the next room, kick the door down, kill the bugbears, take their stuff, right? Right. Keep on the borderlands. B module B two is that's your Huckleberry, because that's that's that that is it is a box canyon full of individual caves where really there's no. And, I love Keep on the Borderland. Don't get me wrong, but there's no story, right? The king has said, "I'm I'm the the last civilized space on the frontier. Over there in those hills are a bunch of bad guys. Go clear them out for me." And that's it. That's the story. That's the adventure. Go go kick down doors and beat up bugbears and take their crap. Nice. Um, but that's. That's if you want murder hoboing to be your your goal. Do you have a different set of goals? Do you also do you want to play the same character for a year and a half? Sure. Right. Yeah. I mean, characters die and you have to swap people in and out and that kind of thing. But right, if you want that long, like I, yep, I'm a level one alchemist and I made the mistake, you know, newbie mistake of getting drunk in the pub by the waterfront. And now I've been press ganged into a pirate ship with a bunch of other people. And I'm going to start at level one and I'm going to grow as an alchemist and maybe mutiny and take over the ship by the end of the adventure. And now, hey, I started adventure path number two with my own ship, but now I've got to compete with other pirates and I'm describing Paizo's skull and shackles adventure path but right that leads you all the way from level one to level 20 master of a pirate fleet with your very own island right yeah. and if that's the kind of adventure you want to play right then you can go in go in that direction and that kind of feeds into that story what kind of story are you looking to tell what kind of story are you looking to interact with right so once you can answer that like how much time do we have how much interest do we have what are our actual goals? And then what kind of story are we interested in? Um, answer those questions, and then you'll be able to start to pick through that millions of hits and go, yeah, I, I dig pirates, and I dig personal development, and, you know, hey, let's play Skull and Shackles. Or I want I only have time for this. So what we haven't mentioned yet uh, in terms of picking modules is your level of experience. Because there are certainly modules out there that are designed and written to be more entry-level modules. Um, and part of your search for a module can can be, brand new DM, going to play 5e, what should I play? Um, most people will point you towards the Lost Minds of Fandelver. I think that's the, the most common. That or there is an adventure in the... Uh, 
like the starter kit, I believe. Yeah. So, and then, then of course, as you continue to play and sort of learn, you know, what is easier and more difficult for you to manage as a DM when you're in your friendly local game store flipping through modules, you can sort of have a better idea of what to look for. <clears throat> yep. Um, so you mentioned it a couple minutes ago about one shots and, and different types of modules. You want to sure, break so, that down? So, yeah. So when we're, when we're talking about modules, I classify them into kind of how long they're going to take to play or how involved they are. Right. So, uh, a one shot module would be something like the Starfinder demo adventure. I think it's number one dash zero, uh, on their webpage. And it might even be a free download by now. Hmm. Um, but that was, we played that at Gen Con. Yeah. Um, and it was, it's six scenes. You, you take a character through six, six different, they're connected. It isn't just like, okay, here's a scene. You're in this situation. It's like, there's, in encounter but not how people would typically use it right so there's you know you get your boss calls you in and says okay group of of starfinders um we want you to go get information from this guy and there's a so so there's the social interaction encounter he gives you information that leads you to uh explore a part of the space station where you have a melee combat encounter um after that melee combat encounter, you learn that there's a bunch of people trying to escape on a spaceship, so you have space combat encounter, and then you board the spaceship, so you have a boarding action encounter. And so it that one shot is that you can actually play it in as six one about what forty minute settings. Um, I think that's what we did half hour to forty minutes. You know, hey, okay, yeah. here's your situation. Boom, here your pre generated characters go. I don't know that we made it through all the way, but I I I played it through all the way when I was uh, GMing the Pathfinder Society okay. uh, role play at, at Vermont Tech. Um, we played all six in in sequence, and it, it was really good. Um, but it didn't it you could get that done in two and a half three hours tops. Totally, right? totally. Um, Expedition to the Barrier Peaks. Any of the con modules right and and when you go to conventions role play game companies love to have people sit down and play games so uh they write modules that can be played in a four hour chunk right you go to the convention you sign up to play uh call of cthulhu and you know you pay your two dollars or four dollar generic tickets and you sit down and play with a bunch of strangers for four hours right um, and you get you get to play those role play games. So any of those convention modules like Expedition to the Barrier Peaks are written for a quick resolution. Right. It, it isn't the long, lengthy sandbox. OK, cool. You know, hey, you're you're in Barovia. What do you guys want to do now? It's like, oh, I don't know. You know, I think I'll go hunt wolves with my bow and arrow for a month and, and just learn the land. It's like, oh, OK, cool. Well, you're going to go off and do that. <laughs> the rest of the party is going to go do this. Right. Uh, and then Sailors Sailors on the Starless Sea from Goodman Games, that's a DCC module. That's one of the best modules, I think, that I've... Uh, people love it. I love it. Okay. Um, There's two Starless ones. Sailors is the one with the underground lake? Yes. Okay. Yes. That was pretty good. It's. Uh, I think it's one of my favorites. So those are those are one-shots, right? You can get in play get out the thing yeah. with one shots is they tend to be kind of really right to keep people moving we got to keep people moving if we're going to be done playing in, in in a set amount of time right um which is probably why you're not a sailors sailors is kind of really right yeah. you go to the keep it was good keep, don't get me wrong like beast men you go into the into the you go into the dungeon you find out what's going on in the dungeon, you defeat the big bad, and you're, you know, done. It's like an instant. It's, it's almost like an instance in an MMO. Right. It's a single dungeon. It's not a, right. a campaign. Right. And so that's when I think one-shots, I think those single dungeons, 
Call of Cthulhu, Single Mysteries, uh, Starfinder, um, Starfinder Society play. So if you subscribe to their monthly module to play in the organized play system, mm -hmm. those are traditionally built to be done in a four-hour session. Sure. Yeah. So that's the one shot. Yeah. You mentioned, the, so you started to talk about series. Is it se se series? series? Multiple series, series, I? series, yeah. I, series is, series is, or it's just series. So yeah. yeah, so the module series, we, we don't see this as much anymore as we did back in the olden days. Um, you just, the, the market has changed, right? Um, 5e is re releasing things like Tomb of Annihilation, Curse of Strahd, uh, Rise of Tiamat, these these hardcover epic uh, adventures. Um, back in the olden days, you would get a module like G1, G2, G3, that's against the Giants. It's three separate modules. Um, you would buy G1 and play G1, then you buy G2 and play G2, and then you buy G3 and play G3. And then there was D1, right? After you beat up the Giants, you learned that they were getting a lot of their financing and magical abilities from these dark elves called drow. And you would do D1, D2, and D3. And that was the drow series. And that concluded with you were in the underdark, beating up dark elves. And then this minor demon called Loth said, hey, stop beating up my children. And she sucked you into the abyss and you played Q1, queen of the demon web pits, right? It's just kind of a linear... And but each module you'd play in in series. Yeah, uh, you you can still see some of that. Like Rise of the Drow from Adventure a Week is kind of a serial module. It's it's got a little bit more sandboxy. You don't have to do their adventures all in one. Do this one, then do this one, then do this one. You can kind right. of pick and choose which one you do. Um, but the you'll still see series modules with a letter and a number. Um, Goodman Games has numbered modules, right? Number one, number two, number three. Yeah. Um, but it's it's not as common as it used to be. Sure. But if you're looking for modules and you're like, wow, S1, Tomb of Horrors, A, Tomb of Horrors is amazing. Uh, and B, play it, but make sure you aren't emotionally engaged with the characters that you're playing. Because it's... It's well, bad. well, you should always <laughs> be engaged emotionally with your characters, but you know, don't get too attached. Don't get attached, right? It's like playing Alien. You're gonna die by the end of Tomb of Horrors. Maybe, maybe most of the time. <laughs> maybe you pull unless unless you piss off your GM and you go, "Look, I'm a level 15 Cavalier. I've got 15 retainers and seven horses and nine donkeys, and I've built a camp outside this dungeon. <laughs> We're just gonna." Send a donkey in. That's how we beat Tomb of Horrors. Is we just kept sh shoving livestock through <laughs> the dungeon, and they would fall into the pits. Oh man! They would walk into the traps, and they would, and and the DM is just like, okay, fine. Like your druid you, would like a word with you. Are you finally ready? Well, we didn't have druids back then. It's like, are you finally ready to adventure? Yes. Okay. Well, you step over nine dead donkey corpses that are filling up this pit and that pit and that pit. Yikes! Now it's it was just yeah it was. It was very frustrating. I mean, we hired carpenters to cover the pits and wow. we would, you know, we, we kind of, um, the five, I'm, I don't know if, if people will be familiar with this, but the five minute work day, this I is, those, so, so this is one of the problems I have with fifth edition D and D is you have the five minute work day. You go in, you have your first encounter, you burn all your spells and then you go, yep, it's, uh, it's 9.22 a.m. Long rest. It's no. Like, what? No. Well, then we're going back to town. <laughs> yeah. And it'll take us, you know, it'll take us two or three hours to go back to town. Some of that is a writing mishap where we'll, I have, I've gotten we'll much have better to, about it in my homebrew. Yeah. We'll have a late lunch, and then maybe we'll hang out in the tavern, do a little shopping. Then we'll get a good night's sleep, and then we'll come back. And we'll walk another 60 feet into the dungeon. <laughs> Rinse and repeat. Cast all our spells. 
it's now 9 37 a.m you know yeah <laughs> yeah that's that's the five minute work work day okay uh, which can be a problem for for dms we should probably talk about that in a in an episode uh maybe so i don't that know we, that that's I don't know if that warrants a whole, yeah, we'll, we'll maybe put it on the list. broken mechanics kind of thing. So then we move from series. So what happened to series? Um, series became adventure paths and campaigns and campaigns, right? Kind and I split. actually split those up into two. Yeah, uh, campaigns for me are like Curse of Strahd, Tomb of Annihilation, Rise of Tiamat. Um, it's a single book, and you have to play through the whole thing um to they, to, they call uh, it a dread adventure a dread adventure okay <laughs> so adventure paths right this is more of a paizo uh construct Boy. it's i know i know <laughs> um, no no you we should talk go ahead but so so they usually come in six book increments right and they so rise if you do if you look up rise of the rune lords i think that was their very first one Right there's okay, one dash one, go. and that's that starts you off in in the Rise of the Rune Lords adventure. You're at Sand Point, I think is the name of the town. Yes, um, it's called there Burnt are, Offerings. Yep, there are recurring NPCs, and it gives your level one to three characters something to do. Right there's an adventure. The mayor's asking them to take to look into things. Um, and then it moves to 1-2, 1-3, 1-4. as familiar with the Rise of the Rune Lords. I play the card game version of it. I haven't ever actually played the rest. Okay. Well, I've got the wiki right here. So it's Burnt Offerings, The Skinsaw Murders, The Hook Mountain Massacre, Fortress of the Stone Giants, Sins of the Saviors, and Spires of Zinshalast. Zinshalast, right? And that's... That last mod, one dash six is the big bad fight, right? By then you're supposed to be level what, eleven to thirteen or thirteen to seventeen or seventeen to twenty. But it that adventure path, those six books take you from level 14th. one, level one noob to level fourteen, right? For the and then you are done, right? You've you've adventured in um in stone sand point right is the town yeah um and There's you've adventured in this here, but... and and so that's that's one adventure path there are uh many 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 adventure paths and they all have kind of different themes so rise of the rune lord is your traditional high fantasy you know you go you, you're new people you show up you go to town um People tell you what to do, and eventually you kind of grow into be the local hero. Um, Skull and Shackles, which is one of my favorite adventure paths from Paizo, you are hanging out in a bar, and you get press-ganged onto a pirate ship. Mm -hmm. And then there's a whole pirate adventure at sea. Um, that adventure path includes gunpowder, so you can play the gunslinger class if you like that um pirate adventure kind of thing yeah and that takes you again from you know i'm some wet behind the ears newbie drinking in a bar to i'm the pirate i'm the admiral of a small fleet with my own island and i'm on the pirate council Swimming and women in the gold yep so so there's that and then there's others right there wrath of the righteous is a religious i don't want to say you pal that's Just that's for your just Cleric go look up Paizo if you are yeah. interested in that. So, and each of these adventure paths have specific, like there's a Jade Serpent, which has a very Asian feel. We go back to the question, like what kind of game do you want to play? Do you want to play a Circle of Iron, Bruce Lee style fantasy adventure? Then there's an adventure path for that. You love Vikings? There's an adventure path for that. You want uh mummies and egyptians there's a whole adventure path for that pirates traditional fantasy uh the harrowing at hallowstone is a gothic adventure right that's vampires and ghosts and mystery um I yeah so, <laughs> so there are yeah i mean if you look up at the paizo adventure path family you're gonna see that there are 
dozens you'll, of those. If you, right. If you look it up, you'll see everything there is to to see about it. <clears throat> <laughs> yep. And and they're they also the nice thing with Paizo Adventure Paths is that they also include. Um, I mean, there's so it's marketing, right? They're they're trying to they're trying to separate you from your your uh, disposable income. You can get Adventure Path custom dice. Each of the Adventure Paths has their own set of polyhedral dice, which are themed for the Adventure Path. Um, there are map flip books and token books and cards. So uh, if you really love Skull and Shackles, you can get loot cards as a GM. So you have a deck of cards in the party loot some random NPC, you can just shuffle and deal out three cards and go, oh, look, he's got a spyglass and an eye patch and uh, a snuff box, right? And those are all the just generic random things in the in the deck. Um, so I'm not trying to sell Paizo, um, but... You had me fooled. <laughs> it's, it, it is, I love Skull and Shackles, okay? So that's, yes, that's my bias. I love that adventure path. If, I'm going to find a group and make them play that. I don't know who it's going to be. It might be you and your siblings if you want your inheritance. Uh, okay. All right. <laughs> but but that's and and then the Starfinder product they they're doing the same thing with Starfinder, right? So you can get adventure paths for Starfinder. Um, You're still running thing. the Paizo ad. I, I am. <laughs> and, and so, but that but that adventure path idea. Um, is a great way to, and and the nice thing, the, the, I'll get off my love <laughs> fest for Paizo here in a minute, right? Okay. It's a six book series. You buy the first book. You don't like it, right? Oh, I thought I totally wanted this um, church versus demons, wrath of the righteous. You know, we all want to be paladins and clerics and we play the first adventure and man, this is, you know, we were murder hobos and not killing prisoners is really hard and not beating people up and taking their stuff is, is like, that's, that was half the fun of the game. It's like arguing over the loot after we beat this, like, but you're a lawful good paladin, man. They threw down their arms and put their hands up. You, you don't get to run them through with a sword. It's like, wow, we, you know, we didn't really like this. It's like, okay, cool. I take that book. I go to my friendly local game store. I sell it to the second hand desk <laughs> and I pick up a new one. And we try Vikings and the frost giant blue, you know, their light blue frost giant things. Right. And sure. we try to do that and see if that's more to our liking kind of thing. Yeah. Right. Where we'll go and talk about the, um, we get Alternatively, back you could pick up Curse of Strahd or a campaign book yes. and have your – they tend to be level fluid. Uh, it kind of depends on where you're at and where you decide to go and how your DM decides to do XP. Um, we can talk more about XP in the future, but most people – uh, in 5e at least, or I think it's most role-playing games, either have some encounter-based XP, so that's killing monsters and passing notable checks, um, and others, like myself, for example, use uh, a milestone system, so when the party pr progresses to a certain point in the story, typically after some kind of wonderful fight or revealing encounter, we'll, we'll level up. Um, so in something like Curse of Strahd, they have a, a guide right in the beginning that says, here are sort of the recommended levels for the zones and the order that you might want to go in, but you don't have to do that, and mm -hmm. you can opt to go around when and where you want. Um, I don't know the specifics on an adventure path, but I think campaigns are, are written to be um, a little bit more open-ended. Yeah. Yeah. At yeah, least I think between, you know, point A and point B. Yeah. No, adventure paths are very like you should be level one to three in this first book and then four to seven in the second book and then eight to yeah. twelve in the third book. And then so th there there will be specific um, level requirements for those those different books. Sure. Right. 
but know. yeah, the, I mean, that's the downside with the campaign is if you buy Curse of Strahd, what's what's the retail? What's the MSRP on Curse of Strahd? I'm pretty sure it's 40. Yeah. Oh, it's 50. Well, suggested retail. Yeah, so like if you pay retail, you're looking at 45, 50 bucks. Which is three of your Adventure Path books. So if you want yeah. to play through all of the Adventure Path, you're still paying more than a campaign. Nope, that's that's true. That's true, but that's a, that's a big... So for the budget-conscious GM, or if you're just new into the hobby, I mean, that you don't want to... That could be sticker shock, right? I had to buy the player's handbook and the dungeon master's guide and the monster manual. You don't really need the monster manual. Don't buy the monster manual until, you know, eh. You don't... Look, the SRD is online. So if you need to look up monster stats, just right. look it up online. You've got a lot of base information. You really just need, like, very, very base. The one that you need is the player handbook, which will gotta have the walk players. you through player creation and rules for things that the srd doesn't um right. the source reference document the srd which we talked about in an earlier episode a little bit contains the open game license content that is just content it's not rules or instructions it is monster stat blocks and spell descriptions and armor values and the like yeah it's all crunch there's zero but, fluff. But that's I, I look, I I have played Curse of Strahd, I've played Tomb of Annihilation. I loved both of those experiences. Okay. Well worth the fifty dollar price tag. Okay. Totally. I mean like if, GM paid it, I didn't pay it, he paid it, but I loved playing it. So um, so if you you mentioned sticker shock, and before we get yep. too far away from that, uh if you think about tabletop role playing games alongside like going to the movies for instance you're looking at eight to twelve bucks a ticket and five to twenty bucks on snacks depending on who you are and who you go with and what have you so let's say like twenty bucks as a conservative estimate for two hours of entertainment where you're fifty bucks or forty probably if you actually buy it in a store um, that Curse of Strahd will run you is going to be what you said a year. Yeah. So if, if of we weekly I mean, sessions, we we did three. We do three hour weekly sessions. Um, of course, we didn't do we. No group meets fifty two weeks a year, right? Because right. so there's Christmas say, and. Let's say you even met forty. You're still looking yeah. at hundred and twenty hours of entertainment. Oh, those. easily, easily 120 hours, because then even when you're not playing, you're still for me, I'm still thinking and planning and writing backstory. I do and, it too. You know. So so that that's probably 200 hours of entertainment. And if you went to 100 movies, right? Yeah, yeah. At 20 <laughs> it, bucks a pop, you're you're looking at what, two grand? Yeah. So if a $50 book record. looks a little bit scary. But if you think about the value that you will get out of it, the social value, the camaraderie, um, it it becomes a whole lot less intimidating. Yep. And That's what I tell your mother, and she hasn't divorced me yet. <laughs> and if you <laughs> and if you are trying to be financially conscious, then drive through RPG also has lots of of feasible options for those of us who work uh, not great jobs. Well then, fifty probably five e. I mean, they're also much. I don't want to say cheaper because that gives people the impression that they're lower quality. Um, more affordable. But there are more affordable role play game options than fifth edition or Paizo or. Absolutely, those big good, names sell you the name. Right. So. And but and to be fair. Right. The production quality of those materials is fabulous, right? They've earned Both that name. Um, and lots of playtesting, lots of, like, Curse of Strahd is an amazingly well-put-together adventure. Written by novelists. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's it, and, yeah, they have earned it. And if you sure. go to DCC, right, if you go to Goodman Games and you pick up Dungeon Crawl Classics, 
Um, you're going to see things written by Harley Stroh and um, Mr. LaSalle, whose first name escapes me at the moment. Brendan, Brendan LaSalle and Harley Stroh. And those guys are just phenomenal writers. They, they write a number, like Harley Stroh has hundreds of modules under his belt. Um, and they also GM their modules at conventions. So you go to any of the Gary Con, um, Gen Con, Origins, any of the big conventions, and these you'll be sitting across the table from, you know, Harley Stroll. He'll be running your game. And you get to run the game with the guy who wrote the adventure, and it's just such a wonderful experience. Um, and then I see we we have totally skipped over the learn to play module. Well, that's, that's next. Is next? Okay. What is a learn to play module? So a learn to play module is like uh, Free League's Publishing's Chariot of the Gods for Alien. Um, the starter modules you'll find in some of Fantasy Flight's uh, Star Wars roleplay game. It's basically a module that so, has the rules built in for the situation that you're in. Yeah, the fi so the 5e starter set as well has a, yeah. a characters 1 to 5. And the, the Shadowrun starter box also includes that kind of... So there's an adventure, and there's the read this to the players, then there's the... <laughs> Don't read this accidentally. Don't read, no, don't, stop reading out loud, dummy. Don't read this to the players <laughs> accidentally. Um, you know, what, what's going to happen and what's in the room and what, what they should learn. And then uh, a call-out box with, at this point, the players are going to ask you, can I make a, can I search for traps? And this is how you search, search for hidden traps, Pookie. So this is how you search for hidden traps. You roll this die, ask this person to roll this die. And it usually even has the pre-gen character stats up there. So you, yep. you don't even have to do arithmetic at that point. You just roll um, and then you move to the next page, right? So learn to play modules are great, especially if you're new or if you're trying out a system and not everybody is has read through the rule book. Right. Those are those are fantastic um, experiences. Those are usually pretty short. Right. right? You're trying to figure out if you even like this game. Like, hey, man, I bought the $35 starter set. Am I going in for the $60 core rulebook, or am I just, yep, rolled some dice, yep, rolled some dice, eh, yeah, this was okay, or, eh, I don't want to play this again. Part of that also is that RPGs are so open-ended that you play that starter set, and it takes you, you know, your takes you two sessions because everyone is still learning, so you've been playing for eight hours, and you get through all of that. Um it's only those two sessions, and then from there, if you feel like you want to be writing and creating and world building and all of that, you can shortly after learning how to play. Um, so using a module to get past that, how, how does this all work mechanically? What do we do while we're sitting around the table with pencils and dice? Like, how is this a game? Once you get past that and you want to create... Um, a learn to play introductory beginner level module will be short enough to let you jump in right when you're ready to. Yep. Um, cool. Yeah, we got through that uh, a little bit quicker than normal, but that's okay. Um, do you have any final notes on modules? Um, so I think, again, yeah, I'm not trying to sell things, right? Unless but, Goodman Games wants to sponsor us. Unless Goodman Games <laughs> wants to, I love Goodman Games, man. So I, I will. I, they, they, they are. Our, so we've got. I'll put my historian cap on, right? <laughs> we've got thirty years, right? Eighty four, ninety four, two thousand four, twenty fourteen. Forty years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, forty six, if you want to get picky, um, of content that's been generated and published and um so you can go back and play some of the older modules right yeah they have problems that right there's some some of the modules don't 
don't work well. Um, some of them are imbalanced, right? They've been around for 40 years. So people have They're gone, rougher. yep, I, I really like this one. I really don't like this one. Um, one of the things that's happening is Goodman Games is taking some of the the ones that people just absolutely love, right? So we talked about B2, Keep on the Borderlands. And if you were in the first wave of Dungeons & Dragons players in that first big uh, ascendancy of TSR, late 70s through the mid 80s, um, you played Keep on the Borderlands. Oh. And it is a murder hobo extravaganza, right? I think we already talked about it. Mm -hmm. You're at the castle. Over there is a bunch of hills full of riddled with caves. And in each cave, you will find goblins, bugbears, orcs. They have stuff that you want. Go, you know, pointy end of the sword into the orc, take his stuff, move to the next room kind of thing. Um, but everyone played it. It was one of those things like everybody who's in their mid 40s to early 50s who plays this game played Keep on the Borderlands. Sure. Okay. Goodman Games has re-released Keep on the Borderlands. They have, um, and again, in Sticker Shock, it's 50 bucks, um, but it is the original maps with the original content from TSR and a 5E updated adventure. Nice. So, and, and a set of essays from people like Brendan LaSalle and Joseph Goodman and James Ward, people who were involved in the original writing of the module, and people who were involved in recreating the, the experience. Um, Very cool. So that's that's Keep on the Borderlands. They have X1, which is the Isle of Dread, right? So Keep on the Borderlands is your classic linear dungeon crawl. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Isle of Dread is your was the very first or one of the very first hex crawls. You've crashed on a desert island. It's full of danger and dinosaurs and, and, and treasure. And you move from one hex to another hex looking for trouble and adventure and treasure and, yeah. and things to hunt. Um, they did Expedition to the Barrier Peaks, which is the you explore a crashed spaceship. And then yeah. they're, doing, they're doing a new one. And I... I can't remember the new ones. Um, they announced it at Gen Con, and I cannot remember for the life of me remember it. Goodman Games, a adventure. Yeah, it's reincarnation number four. Let me just pull that up really quick. Sure. Lost City, the Lost City, which is another one of those classic um, adventures, right? Everyone, I shouldn't say everyone played the Lost City, but that was another one of those that you could always, like, you can always find people who played the Lost, um, the Lost City. And you talk about, hey, how far did you get, right? It's, it's a, it plays a lot like the old, rogue or net hack computer game you're you're just delving into a dungeon and the deeper you go the more danger you get into so you kind of figure out how far did you get kind of thing sure um it's one of those um but those you can i would recommend those um any one of those you don't have to get all four obviously um but it gives you a great starting place for this is what the module used to look like and this is kind of how the game has changed over time, right? So if you want to play some of that older content, yep, you can totally find them on eBay, the secondhand store, uh, secondhand shelf of your friendly local game store. You usually have some old adventures like that. Um, but if you can't find them or you, you want the, yeah, that was then, this is now kind of contrast. The, they're, they're the homage, I call that the homage module. Uh, <laughs> those, those are really good. Very cool. Uh, well, I think that is a uh, neat place to end the show, um, telling you to go all the way back and play some of the first stuff that was out there, which I think is uh, kind of inspirational, too, um, since I know that 
D and D specifically got some press after Stranger Things, and people are looking at the older content, um, knowing that you can play the older content without all of the bugs features that it had at launch. I mean, um, yeah. So, so the I mean, the mechanics were were dated. There, there's just a lot. No, there's there's a lot of disjointedness in some of the older campaigns, right? Sure. Um, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons had a hit table. So I took my to hit score and your armor class, and then I looked up what I needed to roll on a table. And there were tables for each class and tables for races. You know, if you're a if you're a assassin, you roll on this table. If you're a fighter, you roll on that table. Um, where sure. you know, in in five e, we've we've cleaned that up. Where what's your armor class? Okay, I've got to roll equal or higher to hit you. Right. So it just it makes the game play a little bit faster. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but that's a very cool thing to be able to go back to. Uh, so that has been uh, Set the Table Episode 4 on modules. Uh, if you would like to comment on the show or connect with us, the best way to do so is on Twitter. Uh, you can follow or tweet at me at jmscoda 5 or at Red Hoodie Games. Uh, alternatively, uh, you could visit the Red Hoodie Games blog. That's redhoodiegames5.wordpress.com. Um, Bi-weekly, free, available, uh, creative content up there. Um, tell your friends, let people know where you got it from, that sort of thing. Uh, and finally, if you would like to support us uh, any more for doing the show, please hide... Ugh please head on over to patreon.com slash SCOTA, that's S-K-O-D-A, um, and anything that you do to support the show, even just listening, is wonderful. So that has been episode four, uh, and thank you very much, and we will see you in two weeks. Good day.